Hello, welcome to the Farfetch Podcast. My name is Ryan Hawk, and today I will be reading you a story called Dinosaur Island. It is the story of an island that has dinosaurs on it, but more importantly, these dinosaurs have been put on there uh, through a genetic miracle, basically, and from a very psychotic man. And these three scientists who really thought they were going there to um, investigate monkeys and this small population of villagers that live on this island find out that the villagers are dead, the monkeys are dead, all the other exotic creatures on the island are dead, and all that's left is dinosaurs. So if that sounds interesting to you, I hope that uh, this story really does that idea justice. Um, So without further ado, I'm Ryan Hawk. Again, I wrote the story, and enjoy it. They only kept me around because I knew how to heal their wounds better than anyone else. When theropods rip into each other's skin with sharp teeth as they do during their altercations, I am the one who patches it up. Who else would be crazy enough to do it? The mornings on the island would go a little bit like this. The bronchiosauruses would wake me up in the morning and eat from the trees high above. This would cause branches and twigs to fall right on my face when I was trying to get some sleep, and from there, the velociraptors would who I'd spend all night trying to calm down, would wake up from the sound of branches. They wanted their morning monkey carcass to chew on and tear apart. Although it sounded like a hard animal to hunt every morning, it actually wasn't, because the herbivores would practically ravage trees and pull them down with with force. Then the monkeys would come falling down from the trees they were gripping on, often, and die. But that was only one of the ways I was able to collect them easily. Another was when they would try to jump on the backs of stegosauruses only to be smacked against the trunks of palm trees ceaselessly. That is, until they were a collection of broken bones and splattered brains. Then I would pick up the pieces and use those to feed the velociraptors too. After feeding them, I would try to make sure my camp was clear of any of the large theropods. You know, the Tyrannosaurus rexes and the Spinosauruses and the Utoraptors too, they would come onto my camp and tear everything up. I had an innate fear that they would be the ones to tear me up because they were so erratic and unpredictable. However, I tried to document their pattern so I could predict where they'd be around the jungle. I also put trackers on them, the ones that we were supposed to use on the monkeys. These calculated their eating habits and when, where they tended to take dumps and all of that so I could move my camp when necessary. All of my medical supplies were in my tent. Penicillin, for example, was one of the drugs I injected in the dinosaurs whenever they looked lethargic after a big battle against another dinosaur. After injection, I would take a number of days for the reptile to get back to its old self. I had a large collection of penicillin and other drugs in my tent that I used to keep many of the dinosaurs alive. My care for them, in effect, was the reason why they seemed to protect me. They didn't like me, per se, but when they realized I was a great and necessary asset in keeping them alive, they kept me around. So destroying my supplies and tools would make me a nuisance to them, and that was the last thing I wanted to be. My day would consist of a lot of tracking, yes, but I would also send messages out to any surrounding ships with my radio. I was originally on this island with a group of three scientists who were attempting to uncover and study an animal that was thought to be endangered, the golden-haired Tamaranian. It was said that they were spread all around the jungle of the island by the, by the settlers that lived here, but that was many years ago and things have changed on the island f- from that point. By the time us scientists got there by boat, all of the settlers were dead and only their bones remained. That was because, for some unexplained reason, dinosaurs found their way onto the island. Many species had been living there for many years. Because the island was so off the radar of the Western world, nobody knew about the crisis that tore apart the islander population. One by one, my scientist colleagues were picked apart by the dinosaurs. I could say I survived because I had more practice calming predators because I worked at a crocodile farm during college, but that would be facetious. If I was being honest, I shouldn't have been alive for as long as I was. The dinosaurs would look at me like they wanted to eat me whole on many occasions, but were restricted in doing so somehow. My medical skills could only hold them back so far. In my small amount of research on dinosaurs, I could tell that they act on impulse often. I've been stranded on this island, I would say into this microphone, and I need help. 
there are dangerous creatures here, so it's very important that you stay at the dock if you try to rescue me. It's the only way I can ensure your safety. I tried to make my cries for help not sound so desperate, but that was very hard. If I was on a boat that was passing and heard my pleas for help, I don't know if I would stop. So every day I tried to make the situation sound as normal as possible, like I was just a girl stranded on an island. But that wouldn't explain why there was no one on the island, and so on and so forth, and it just became more complicated from there. It was simply impossible to avoid talking about the dinosaurs and all the damage they'd done. So I was effectively trapped, because our boat left long ago. That was unless I found a boat that the islanders used to travel around the shore of the island. So about two weeks after our arrival on the island, I went on a personal exodus to exit the jungle and reach the coast. This was harder than I would have ever imagined. In order to do that, I would have to bypass some of the most fearsome theropods on the island. They didn't go into the jungle because they were too large and they would have to snack, smack trees down just to move around. It was one of the reasons why I stayed in the jungle to begin with, to avoid them. But that irrational fear had to end. And it started by edging my camp closer and closer to the coast each day. Towards midday, I would have some kind of meal. Usually it was fruit from the island's various bushes and vines. Thankfully, there was a decent amount of it, although I got very old very quickly. And as I mentioned before, I would slice up the monkeys and lemurs and snakes, and that fell from the trees, cook them, and eat a little bit for myself, too. Then I would move the camp as far as I could. I had a small tent, a couple of cooking items, and a tranquilizer gun that the scientists kept for the monkeys. There were more of them at our original camp, but I prayed I would escape and never have to go back there. Each day, I would make about a mile effort, more or less. Mind you, that would include me hiding from all manner of theropods that could easily run past the trees, such as the Velociraptors, or the Orthiomyces too. Not the T-Rex or the other larger ones, but the smaller ones. Once the day ended, finding a small place to sleep was more difficult. There wasn't a lot of sleep in my time on the island, I can assure you, but the time I did sleep was when I climbed to the top of the trees that I knew the Titanosaurus couldn't get to because it was in the thick jungle. And then, repeat, I would continue all of it again and again to no avail, and honestly, I'm writing this so I can explain every detail of Dinosaur Island to the best of my abilities. I felt like writing it all down in a journal would help me try to explain it. I'd like to think someone would find this if I don't survive, but even that's a lot to expect. In retrospect, I'd like it to be in my front shirt pocket for the person who found my dead body to open up and read what I had to say, but likely my journal would get ripped apart by some random dinosaur that searched my pockets with its tiny little head. I would say that things started to shift during my time on Dinosaur Island when I realized a shift in the patterns. The Tyrannosauruses would usually separate themselves into different parts of the island so they would have different prey, of course. For some reason, this one night, all of the larger theropods gathered in the exact same place. I tried to get a vantage point where I could see if they were fighting or breeding, but I couldn't make it out. And this happened again and again, but exclusively at night. So when I gathered enough courage to go to that spot in the morning, I found a silver gun lying on the ground. Is this what you've, they've come to look at? I asked myself out loud. I occasionally did this because I was lonely and I wanted someone to talk to. It was hot because it had been laying in the sun all afternoon. I used my shirt pocket to pick it up and looked at it. I was no expert with guns, and I had a hard time even loading the tranquilizer gun that I was trained with, but I could at least tell that this was not a normal one. Instead, it looked like a device that didn't belong in the place in time like many of the other things on the island. I pulled the trigger and nothing came out of it. No beam of light or bullet or anything. It made a noise, but it did seem like the sun had damaged whatever ability it had to function but I pocketed it anyway, thinking it could possibly work. However, that night, the big theropods returned to the same place, so I left all my things in the middle of the jungle and ran to the spot I found the gun. And when I got there, I saw the first living human I had in two weeks. He was using a gun that looked identical to the one I had and pointed it towards the Tyrannosauruses. He influenced a male T-Rex to mount on another, and the two started mating. Over the two weeks, I'd seen natural mating before. I was an animal scientist, and it was fairly commonplace to see creatures do these sorts of things. It wasn't silly to me or strange. But I'd never seen some use of a machine to manipulate a reptile into mating with another. It felt wrong and obtrusive in every way. I couldn't get myself to watch. 
What are you doing? I asked a man, holding the mind-controlling device. He was wearing these large spectacles, and was in his mid-fifties at least. His shirt was all ripped, and his pants had been torn into shorts. Oh, there you are. I wanted to thank you for tending to my dinosaurs, he said with a smile. He didn't see anything wrong with what he was doing with the weapon he wielded, and I know for a fact he didn't care. I would later find out that he was the one who nurtured the dinosaur species and brought it to the island. He, too, was responsible for the deaths of all the islanders, but I'll get into that later, as it's a whole story within itself. I attempted to grab the weapon away from the man. Stop what you're doing. You're going to make them destroy the jungle. And he smacked me in the head with the weapon, forcing me away. I had to admit, I wasn't expecting a blow to the head like that from a man, especially a man of science and one I just met. I thought scientists had a level of professionalism that they used to approach all of life's conflicts. Although I'd come to find out this man had made many wondrous machines and breakthrough gene-preserving technologies, I could never respect him. This is the one way the population will grow, darling, he snarled and continued to point the weapon towards the dinosaurs, influencing them. They were getting more aggressive with each other now. What started as mating had now become something of a grudge match. It must have had something to do with the manipulation device. Don't you want more of these guys to roam the earth? I'm proud to say my little taming invention will allow me to trade dinosaurs with people all over the world. I think I'll be paid more than, more than handsomely, don't you think? I spat some choice words at him. He was the reason the scientists died. The islanders, too. He was the reason why I was stranded on the island and not visiting my parents after a week of research. And although I hated him in that moment, I thought about killing him and living when, wherever he was living. Maybe it was a nice cave and that none of the dinosaurs could get into. Perhaps he had a collection of canned and preserved foods that he ate daily. He might have had a mini fridge and a little portable battery that he used to power it. He probably had a portable oven top that he cooked pizzas in, too. Once I heard the sound of velociraptors brushing through the bushes and trees behind us, I made a quick leave. There was no way I would be able to tame them myself. I started climbing up the tops of these trees and threw myself limb to limb. I had been good at that. The doctor looked back at me and said, So, that's how you've been getting around? Good girl. I saw the hungry dinosaurs running through the commotion, and I prayed they would eat the horrible doctor. All the progress I'd made trying to get to the coast of the island was ruined because of him. If he hadn't manipulated the theropod's habits, I would have been on a boat out of here by now. When I returned to my camp, my clothes, supplies, and radio had been ravaged through. To me, it looked like an ankylosaurus or a triceratops had just pummeled through the camp because the dead primates I'd skinned were all laying there, and they were vegetarians. I remember crying that night. I honestly think I was going to tranquilize myself just to see if some dinosaur would come over and eat my unconscious body and take all the pain away. Then again, I didn't want to wake up while a velociraptor was chewing on my leg and ripping its razor-sharp teeth into my torso, so I gave up. Instead, I decided to climb higher up this tree with whatever I could salvage from my camp. I tied my torso around the tree so I wouldn't fall to the ground in my sleep. One of the things that was still intact was the second blaster weapon the doctor must have left on the ground accidentally. I shoved the blaster into my pocket. That night up on the tree was a little more sleepless than usual. On most nights I would doze off, and although it was technically still awake, my eyes would get hazy. I would be on the verge of falling asleep. But that night, I couldn't help but be as aware and alert as possible. It was something about me watching those two dinosaurs sinking their teeth into each other that really stuck with me. That was for all good reason, because in the middle of the night I was attacked. These pterodactyls swung down towards the tree and dug their claws into the trunk of it. They woke me up, and then they started to peck at me with their large beaks. If they were to land one powerful strike at my stomach, I would be dead. So I moved as far away from them as possible, and then pulled my gun out of my pocket and aimed it towards them. It was the only option I had, and now that I knew how it worked, I knew it would get me out of the situation. So I pulled the trigger and said, get out of here. Fly away from me now. After a few moments, the pterodactyls did indeed jump off the branch and soared high in the sky. I kept using that blaster during any encounter I would have with the dinosaurs thereafter. When the mammoths felt compelled to run through the trees, I would pull the trigger on them and force them to go to sleep. The saber-toothed tigers would attempt to eat me as I continued to move towards the coast. When this would usually happen, I just threw them, them the body of one of the animals that fell from the trees to preoccupy them. They would mostly prefer the taste of monkey or lemur over the taste of human flesh, at least I'd think. But now that I had the blaster, I just aimed it at them and pulled the trigger. 
I continued with this every single animal encounter I had, and it got me closer to the coast of the island than I'd ever been before. I could just see the water rushing on the shore. I could also see the heads of large aquatic dinosaurs I would later find out to be paleosaurs bobbing up and down. I'd been waiting so long to describe how beautiful the water looked that that moment. It was glistening in the sun like a diamond or a priceless crystal. I had to get there. I wanted to get there so bad, I, I pushed myself through the trees and ran towards the shore with my boots on. I didn't even care if sand found itself in my boot, although it did annoy me from time to time. I put my face in the water and threw the water all over myself. I hadn't showered in weeks, and my skin was starting to feel like it weighed a ton. Pardon the embellishment, but the water really did feel like a baptism. There aren't any boats, I said to myself. After walking the premises for several hours, I made sure to circle the entire island as discreetly as possible. I was destroyed after finding this out, and I would have given up if it wasn't for the dinosaur that peeked its head over the water at that very moment. I took the gun out of my pocket and looked at it, thinking I would be able to control the dinosaur so I, so it could bring me home. I could settle myself on its back, and it would glide with me on the surface of the water. Then I would tell it to bring me to the nearest country, where I would be able to explain everything just by showing them the dinosaur. Then I thought about what would happen if the blaster ran out of power while I was riding on the seafaring dinosaur. Once it regained control of its actions, it would probably use its teeth to rip me off its back and throw me into the water. The very thought of being stranded in the middle of the dangerous ocean outside was terrifying, maybe even more terrifying than being in the jungle. The sailor who brought us to the island said that sharks would hit the boat with their snouts and tails to intimidate. And once, when the sailor was bringing another group to the isolated dinosaur island, one of the members fell off the boat and was decimated by sharks seconds after. I started to wonder where the border between dinosaurs and the contemporary aquatic mammals was. A shark, no matter how powerful it might be, could never defend itself against the Plesiosuchus or the Torvonutes, and even the Spinosaurus, who had occasionally lowered itself into the ocean to catch fish. It would decimate the shark in its path. So that's when I decided I would need to find a blaster. If my first one ran out of juice, I would be dead irrefutably on the back of that seafaring dinosaur. As much as I didn't want to go back to the doctor, I had to find out where he lived so I could take all the blasters he had and leave. I ran back through the jungle with the weapon held out so I could defend myself against enemy dinosaurs. My intention was to go back to the spot where the doctor collected the theropods. However, I didn't need to travel that long at all because the doctor was already watching me. At first, I figured he wanted to get his gun back from me before I left. I hate to admit that I was willing to kill someone, but at that moment I wanted to kill him. He was up there in this tree, aiming a rifle at me. He shot the rifle and hit a pterodactyl that was attempting to dig its claws into my shirt and devour me up in the air. It smashed down to the ground and started hyperventilating as the bullet sunk deeper and deeper towards its heart. Then it died. Once the doctor got down to the ground, he said, So you thought you could leave and tell the story of Dinosaur Island to the rest of the world? He asked. And in that moment, shock shot through my body. He held the rifle out towards my body, and I really thought he was going to bust a cap into my pelvis so I would just suffer. I promise I won't tell anybody. I won't tell anybody, I told him. No, it's time for the world to know about Dinosaur Island. Besides, I'm planning on taking these guys to an island with dense forest and a thriving wildlife. That way, my babies won't be forced into cannibalization to survive. God knows they'd already done too much of that, he said. So in that time, I pulled the weapon out, he dropped on the ground, and pointed it towards him. You'll show me where you're keeping more weapons like these, and then I'll kill you and get the wildlife fund to come here and put the dinosaurs in captivity. There's my third gun, he said as I pushed him forward. I must have dropped it when I was holding my latest breeding session. I suppose you want to take me to the other one so you can escape on the back of the dinosaurs? I'll just tell you that's probably not a good plan. Those waters are infested with some nasty predators, and I wouldn't like to see you swept away by them. That's not to mention all the egregious pterodactyls that roam the sky. 
I didn't say anything to him. He used my silence as an excuse to continue talking about his plans and exploits. You know, I found several dino dinosaur eggs preserved in ice. I used to study Arctic marine biology, and then I had a change in interest the moment I saw them. Since I was a child, I'd always wanted to discover something that was my own. I wanted to have a unique taste and interest in things nobody else liked. That's what made me happy, and People called me crazy when they saw me go back to school to learn biology. It was all worth it, though, because I hid those eggs in my garage in Boston in this fridge. I learned how I would hatch them and found an island with a dense wildlife population to do so. As you can see, they live and thrive here and have for over five years. Just imagine what will happen when they come to be 10 years old or 20 years old. By the time we'd finished this story... The two of them got to the cave, which he called his home. I was suspicious that he might have laid out traps for me there, so I forced him to go first in front of me and held the gun out towards his back. Once he got inside, he showed me the collection of weapons that he had, and I threw them all into my backpack. He did have preservable foods and a rechargeable fridge like I thought he would, so I partook in it. I ate like I hadn't eaten in many weeks. And he looked at me and kept telling his stories about how he nurtured a relationship with the Tyrannosaurus Rex and how he built strange mind-controlling weapons. And once it was over, I used some of this hardware equipment to tie him to a tree out in the open jungle. I figured one of the dinosaurs would come over and chew on his flesh and he would die a painfully well-deserved death. He was especially defenseless because he had no way of controlling the massive beasts anymore, at least in theory. So I ran back to the shore and got on one of the seafaring dinosaurs like I originally planned. Keep your back up as you swim, I told it, and make sure to alert me to any threats in the water. Sailing away from Dinosaur Island was surreal. There was no way I was going to go back, but that was a given. So much had happened there in two weeks, and I had to live like a savage. Evolution happened there, regardless of if it was artificial or not. As much as I hated the doctor, I still had to admit I had a strange respect for his breakthroughs. Maybe if his practices weren't harmful and damaging, I would think of him as a friend. The thing dropped me off on an uninhabited island, and thankfully there were islanders who spoke English there. They sailed me to Morocco, which Dinosaur Island was about 100 miles away from, and when I got there, I was able to take a plane back home to America. When I returned there, I told my family and friends about the experience first. They couldn't believe anything I said, naturally, but I had the weapons and images from my phone to show them. I also had this journal entry, which was part of my evidence to the Board of Science. When the government knew about Dinosaur Island and was convinced finally, they sent armored tanks and military soldiers there. The hope was to de-escalate the situation as much as possible, if that is even possible. But the strange thing was that once they got there, the dinosaurs had disappeared fully. Yes, there were obvious traces like footprints and thousands of pounds of dinosaur dung. There were dead bodies of scientists and the islanders who were torn from their villages and their progress, but no dinosaurs. Where did the doctor take them? Probably to another island, similar to what he said to me. But something in me also thinks that he'd gone to Africa or Madagascar and set all those dinosaurs free. He might have used a huge boat like Noah and had extra weapons kept somewhere in that cave so we can control their exoduses. I don't know where the dinosaurs will show up or how they even preserved in the first place, but one thing is for certain though. If those dinosaurs grow exponentially over the next hundred years, I think we have more than future wars to worry about. So that was the story Dinosaur Island. I really love that story. I think it's such a cool idea. Um, I, I've always loved the idea of, you know, the Jurassic Park and these kind of uh, things. But I was just like, well, what would happen if there's just an island dedicated to dinosaurs? Kind of like in the King Kong movie where, um, or in the King Kong mythology where there are islands where there's just dinosaurs and stuff like that and uh you know wild beasts that don't make any sense i love that idea so i wanted to do my own little thing spin on it just having one survivor and, and also seeing kind of an idea where there's this manipulation that's happening to the um animals or the dinosaurs i should say and so anyway that was the attempt there i hope you enjoyed it uh i i'm gonna come to you with another fun story Ironically, science themed, and another one. Um, uh, I think today's Wednesday, so by Saturday it will be uploaded. And so I hope you have a great day. Uh, let me know how I can improve these podcasts, and um, have an amazing week. Thanks.